Hello, I am your moderator for this session. My name is Deeksha Datta. I handle communication for Asia Berlin. And uh, today we have uh, three phenomenal speakers, four phenomenal speakers joining us, three on site and one online. Hello. Hello there, Thomas. Hi, Deeksha. <laughs> Hello, it's always just good, good to check first that we are heard. So uh, thank you everyone for joining and hope you all had a nice break as well. So in this panel, we are going to focus on internationalization of startups. And all four speakers that have joined us are dealing with this aspect of startup internationalization in their capacity and roles with different organizations. So first, I would like to welcome Kim Zidlo. He's the Director, Trend and Innovation Scouting at Digital Hub Initiative. And then we have Till, he's with TechCode Germany and also deals with international, internationalization of startups through their accelerator program. Then we have Volker from Humboldt Innovation and deals more on the university side of startups from research to say science and a combination between science and startups. And then we have joining us online Thomas from German Accelerator who is the head of scouting and also helps startups in internationalization. So thank you all of us. <laughs> so let's start with uh, you, Kim. What is probably in your role with Digital Hub Initiative? How do you deal with internationalization of startups? And what are some of the initiatives of uh, GTII and Digital Hub Initiatives that helps in internationalization? Yeah, thanks a lot, Diksha. Um, first of all, it's uh, fantastic to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, the topic internationalization uh, is really key to our work. Um, so uh, I work at Germany Trade and Invest, the Federal Economic Development Organization of Germany, and I um, yeah, the Director for Trend and Innovation Scouting there. So in that role, um, we as you know, a federal agency for Germany are really the face to the world when it comes to the German startup ecosystem. So that means uh, we build bridges on a national level. You know, we also um, you know, show visibility to the German startup ecosystem when we go abroad, when we speak to actors um, virtually, but also physically nowadays. I just came back from a huge tech fair in Amsterdam, for instance. Um, but also we are the first point of contact when it comes to international startups that want to enter the German market and don't know yet where to go in Germany. Um, and that's... Well, in uh, you know, at the heart, um, the role of an economic development organization. But you also mentioned the Digital Hub Initiative, which is um, a project by the Federal um, Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy, um, um, BMDE, um, in order to drive innovation um, of the German economy through collaboration between startups, academia, um, researchers, talents, and of course, um, the corporates. Um, and in that role, um, we as uh, GTAI um, have, uh, have been carrying the mandate to internationalize the whole ecosystem of 12 digital hubs in Germany um, for the last uh, four and a half years, um, which means internationalizing the initiative in itself, um, but also uh, supporting startups on their way to international markets, um, but also again, um, supporting startups uh, to join the Digital Hub Initiative in Germany. Sure. And we will come to all the 12 digital hubs that you have and what's the focus and when startups should reach out to you. But before that, I mean, uh, let's talk about China. Everybody is interested in China. So uh, I'll just go right at the hardest question. <laughs> Why is it so difficult to crack China and where ju where does tech code really come into the picture when it comes to this strategy of getting into China? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and uh, for this question. Um, I think the you have to really look at what, uh, what we are talking about. So when we talk about startups internationalizing towards China, that's normally startups that have already established their presence in Germany, for example, and other countries in Europe and then they would like to enter in the Chinese market. And there it, it's always from the past, we always have the idea that our, China is just another market and we can just enter the market with our product and then we go there and then we have a subsidiary in China. 
And that's changing a lot. So the product market fit, the business model, also the technological approach that you have when you enter the Chinese market, you have to treat China like a, a standalone market. You have, a, have to have a clear decision if you want to if you want to do China, and then you have to uh, invest a lot of resources and go there and spend some time there and meet people there. And that usually takes much more time to discover who are your partners, who are your investors maybe, or uh, your employees, then that would take time. Like for example, if you expand to France or the US or whatever. So that's really the biggest challenge to, to on the one hand, invest a lot of resources and then have a very long feedback circles on whether you're on the right, on the right way, if your product market fit is right, if you, um, yeah, uh, having the right st strategy, if you have the right business model for this particular market, I guess, to answer this question uh, shortly, that's, the, uh, that's uh, how, how it is at the moment, yeah. And, and where does tech code come into the picture? So we are in a, actually a very, I just talked to Folk about it, in a very small time window where uh, startups or other companies need support. So... Um, you have to do your homework, you have to be a startup, you have to ha have some kind of penetration in the German market, for, mm -hmm. for example. And then when you go to China, um, you have to go there, actually. So a lot of startups that we take on have, on trips or anything, they've never been to startups, co-founders never been there. You have to go there, you have to spend time there. And then there's a lot of support you can do with a lot of community builders, help you connect to the right people, help you connect to investors, to partners. But then this time window closes very, actually very quickly. And then you have to spend time there. You have to go there, spend there weeks, months, and uh, do your own homework because problems become very, very specific very, very fast. So uh, one startup might have uh, a more general problem in the beginning, finding a partner in some certain area, but then they have to run on their own and, and do their. And that in that specific time window, we as Techo try to help. We try to help help build the awareness, bring people over there, get them in first context. That's uh, where we position ourselves. Yeah. So you have to be there if you have to make it. You have to go. There. Okay. <laughs> and yes. that's the problem with the travel situation at the moment, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Volker, with you, uh, actually, that's my favorite part of this panel, probably, is the research-based startups, the startups that are probably the most uh, complicated when it comes to bringing to market and, you know, research-based startups, the startups that take so much time, uh, you know, you have to really go in depth to understand research-based startups. So um, why don't you give us a little bit of background about the different initiatives of Humboldt, Inish, uh, Humboldt Innovation when it comes to working with university-based startups? Yeah, first of all, also thank you for having me. But, um, second time last year, um, I also attended the conference. I'm happy to be back. Um, yeah, as Humboldt Innovation, we are the technology transfer unit of Humboldt University. And our goal is to make the research and innovation of university, um, let's say, applicable for the market. And, and startups are a perfect, um, let's say, channel for doing that. And as you mentioned, it's one of our main jobs is to understand at least the potential, the uh, economic potential within the research to be fair, we never really understand all of the research because mm -hmm. it's uh, on a broad university, it's not possible. But we need to understand the chances and the potential of this research. And then we look how we can support our researchers, our students, our graduates in creating a company. And, and we are uh, at Humboldt University, at Humboldt Innovation, but I also want to include other German universities have really created over the past decade a strong environment for for, for um, science-based startups and, and helping them really to validate their research, um, uh, work on it, uh, write a business plan, support them in the incubator space, uh, create a team. Because when you say what's the most complicated thing on, on, on creating a startup, it's, um, in my opinion, not really understanding the research is really finding the right people uh, to, to, to mix and, and create 
a great team and a great startup. And, and But we're also into that. So for that reason, for example, we use our psychology department to help them to become a great team. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of knowledge within the university supporting that. And then and, and then we come to a stage. Um, so it's always in a very early stage. But what, what we want to show them is where are the chances and risks, for example, in other markets. And there we start with our internationalization programs which I can go into a little bit more than that's if you want. Um, Definitely, yes. <laughs> I can start with that now or later? Yeah, probably after yeah. we go to Thomas. <laughs> so German Accelerator, we all know about it. And also today we have, I think, two startups pitching um, at the end of the day, talking about their international strategy into Asia. But I think probably I have a different question for you, Thomas, is that you've been a founder yourself. And now you are with German Accelerator, helping them internationalize. So tell us a bit about what does your role look like? And how would you actually correlate the mistakes, or I would rather say learnings, not mistakes, that you had while your, uh, you know, looking at your internationalization strategy, and now that you look at the internationalization strategy of the startups you deal with. Well, that, that's a very good uh, question. I guess there's hundreds of mistakes, honestly, I could talk about. Uh, I think every founder can. Um, to be honest, though, like for me, and also when I look at especially early stage startups today, the biggest mistake is always lack of focus, right? So. As a founder, there's so many things going on and uh, you always feel, okay, I am already focused. I'm, I'm leaving so many opportunities behind, but usually that's not the case. Uh, you know, uh, it's like uh, they always say, you know, uh, write down the top five priorities you have, forget about number two to five and only do number one, then you might remotely be, be focused. Um, so that also accounted for me. And um, I have to say it is important, crucially important for internationalization as well. If you consider like uh, moving into the US, or into Asia as a side project, you will not succeed. Um, and the problem is not only will you not succeed in US or in Asia, but also your whole market will suffer and maybe your whole company will, will suffer in the end. So that's really my, my biggest advice for founders. At the same time, I have to admit, uh, for me, uh, it was a bit too much focus when, when I founded my company. Back then, we were kind of the first movers in, in our market. And uh, due to some regulation changes, uh, uh, kind of hyper competition, I want to call it, developed in Germany. And I was so focused on winning that market. And it was so expensive, so much uh, venture capital needed, so much time needed. Um, while what I did not realize is next door in France, there was basically the same demand, same market conditions, but almost no competition. And I have to say, I missed out on that. And that was um, quite costly. So I think in the end, I would give the, the, the tip to founders that like from day one on um, think globally, really try to understand what is your beachhead market, where are the biggest opportunities, but when it comes to execution and um, be super focused and uh, maybe one last sentence when it comes to opportunities, um, that's really what, what surprises me almost on a daily basis in Asia. There is so many opportunities there. Um, be it like from regulation side, be it also like funding side, often from, from governments. So um, founders out there really have a close look to, to Asia or come talk to, to us um, or hear my colleagues on, on stage. Um, I think like me, you might be surprised of, of the opportunities there. Yeah, and, and I think indeed that is the problem. And that brings me to my next question. And probably Kim could throw some light on that. Is that Asia in itself is so huge. And when we talk about, okay, what are some of the, you know, examples that where we can actually learn from, or you are, say, in the, in the area of digitization. So what, where, which regions and where sec, which are the sectors that you look up to when it comes to digitization in Asia that you feel that Germany could actually learn from? Do, do any examples come to, your, to the top of your mind? Well, that's a pretty broad question, uh, and I don't know how much time we have to go through the whole list of countries we could look up for, um, yeah. up, up to, um, well, the thing is, we don't really look at particular countries, um, so what we do is we want to, we, we look at, you know, a lot of countries all over the world just to get some inspiration, I mean, we're not the policy makers, well, this is one thing, you know, 
But of course, we can raise certain topics and we can try to fill some gaps, at least within our capacity. Uh, and for that, of course, it's worthwhile to look at other countries uh, and see what they are doing. Um, and uh, we don't even need to look to Asia for that. We can even look at our European neighbors, uh, just mm. looking north, for instance, uh, Sweden, Denmark are doing great. Uh, Estonia is famous for e-government, um, but also the Netherlands is really doing great. Uh, and um, we can basically see a lot of things that are working out there quite well when it comes to offering digital services, um, when it comes to um, public investments uh, into research and creating a, a framework you know, and a stimulating environment for driving digital innovation um, you know these are all a lot of things um, where there is still a huge potential in germany uh, to catch up um, you know this is actually one thing that you know where we get inspiration as i said but what we look at at the uh, as part of this digital hub initiative and in each of the 12 digital hubs that we have across germany is um, you know we bring together the actors that are relevant for innovation um, and that you know, was one of the topics here as well. Um, you know, knowing the right people um, and uh, you know, getting help from others that have done it, but also others that have an interest in joining you on your journey. This is very important. Right? And a lot of founders um, and then entrepreneurs around here don't really know what kind of support systems are out there. It doesn't really need to be in the, uh, in the field of internationalization. It even starts uh, locally. Um, and this is... Uh, Know, really one big issue which we try to solve um, to, to raise awareness um, and to connect the people and within our 12 digital hubs um, innovation takes place because the people the startups the researchers and the companies are put together and the hubs implement programs to run innovation programs um, to actually make it happen yeah so indeed there is a lot to do locally and within europe as well rightly said and uh, probably, Thomas, I think this is something that you could, how do you answer this question to startups in German Accelerator that uh, when they say, do they come up with queries like, okay, we want to expand in Asia, or do they always know which is the specific country they want to go to, or do they ask you for guidance that we want to expand into Asia, so what do you recommend to us? Uh, what are your experiences with these kind of questions from startups? Um, well, first of all, Often I would uh, I would hope that uh, they pose that question more often. I feel like in in Germany um, most of the startup founders have the idea of uh, the U.S. being the perfect additional market, and uh, sometimes they underestimate the complexity in the U.S. Um, for example, they would think that you know, oh my God, in Asia there's such a big cultural uh, gap for me. Um, in the US there isn't. That's just not true. Um, there is uh, cultural gaps in in both uh, markets. Sometimes maybe they're a bit more obvious uh, than in, in the other case. Um, also, what we often hear is like, okay, US is just one market I have to tackle. In in Asia, it's so many different ones. Again, obviously, that's partly true, but um, only because you're successful in New York doesn't mean um, you're successful in, in the middle of, uh, of America as well. Um, and at the same time, and I have to say that was a big learning for me about Asia, is um, especially when you see those mega cities, um, I'm highly surprised how connected they are. We've seen a lot of startups that, for example, started in, in Singapore, became like you know well known in Singapore didn't tackle any other market. And suddenly they um, had demand from Malaysia, from Thailand, from different uh, countries in, in Southeast Asia. Um, so bottom line for me, sometimes Asia is, um, is undervalued. And that's also what we're trying to, to educate startups with. We're really trying to help them find the right market and give them the tools to, to evaluate um, which market is the right one. And especially also when is the right timing. So we'll come to some examples that you could probably share in that area. But now I will come back <laughs> to Volker. So um, we put a stop right there on you, but we would love to continue that answer in terms of what are actually the initiatives that you have had in the last one year or so, um, specifically to internationalization with university-based startups and what is their outlook when it comes to internationalization? How do they look at it? Yeah, so we're actually celebrating a birthday today because we initiated our internationalization program right at Asia Summit last year. So we yeah. have our birthday party at this event here. 
and um, it's it's something as I mentioned that we are quite in an early stage for our startups and um, we started the program um, we, we actually founded a company called Tumba Track Bridge mm -hmm. and within this company we started a bridge to Asia and especially here bridge to China program because we have seen among our science-based startups founders that there is a need for what is mentioned here before to understand chances and risks better and to prepare we say for the future it's it's not that we say go enter the market it's at least you need to understand what are the challenges the potentials what does it mean for you for the next uh, for your business plan for the next years and um, and and they are seen as uh, Thomas just mentioned. It's um, Asia is not so on the focus. So we need to show them what what are the chances there, what are the risks, and and and, and we started here uh, with China and help our startups to to um, to educate them to really evaluate uh, the chances they have. And we started with a program. Uh, so we have a batch actually running also right now. So everyone who wants to apply, please do so. Uh, and um, and we had our first batch last year uh, with mentors from both sides. Uh, for example, for university sites, it's very important that they understand the uh, risks and chances with uh, intellectual property, but also the culture thing. It's, it's, it's a big thing. I, I stay for a while in China and I know that, that it's, it's really important that you at least understand what is the culture about and, and how, is the, how does the market function, how the people are thinking and what about the language barriers. But everyone who knows goes to China. It's not as saying everyone speaks English. It's not the case. So you need mm -hmm. to have some strategies to get really under, understand the chances there. And um, so we started a program really based on science-based startups. We have a podcast, uh, as I said, we have the next batch and we will soon also open an um, accelerator in Shanghai. And, and we hope that we help our teams um, who grown out of the universities to, um, to, to, to understand it and understand the, the chances for their own company. And I also want to add, we, we work with a strong not network there with our partners. Uh, many of them are here at the moment, uh, German Accelerator as well. So, so we have a strong partner network um, helping them. And, but it's, it's, it's really a goal also from a university to help their own spin-offs and startups to, to have a broader view and not just be so focused on Berlin, Germany or Europe because the biggest risk is that you don't really, you lose to see the competition because, and, and, and that's the biggest problem. Mm. You really don't see what's going on in the world and how fast they are moving. And sometimes, especially here in Germany, we are really slow compared to others. And that's something we want to show our startups there as a world outside this um, this world. Yes. Okay, wow. So for those who are applying, <laughs> what are the kind of uh, things that you look in these applications and the startups you select for this program if you have to rate, if you have to just list two, three things? Well, well, as I say, it's, it, it needs to be there's an early stage. It needs to be science-based. We need to know a scientific mentor. Usually it's a, it's a team startup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Uh, as a limited company, uh, the goal is a limited company. It it's, uh, wants to scale. Uh, so um, that's three or four things more on our website. You can uh, you can look up. But that's, so uh, anybody looking to expand into China here? Well, at least to understand it. That's the first step. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not always the best, but you ne really need to understand what uh, what you're dealing with. So talking about China, till. Uh, guide us. <laughs> what are the hotspots when it comes to China? Why China? What to like? Where to really, really start when it comes to China? Yeah, um, that's also very a little bit difficult to talk about this in in general. But maybe to add on what Volker just said, you could have to look at the cases. So, for example, we work with the startups. They do to put it very in easy language. They want to put internet on the
different ecosystems, independent ecosystems. So if you look at Shenzhen, for example, hardware prototyping hub. So for example, if you're uh, in the area of, of prototyping a hardware product, you probably have to go to Shenzhen because that's where you do that the fastest way on the, on, on the, on the whole world, in the whole world. So you have to have a presence there. And then if you want to have, if you need close connections to the government, you might have to also have a presence in Beijing. And if you're uh, also, some of your investors might be in, in Shanghai, so you have to also have a presence in Shanghai. So you would look at where your customers are, where your investors are, and then choose where, where which city, which ecosystem is the, the hot spot for you in, in your particular business model with your particular product. So that's what I would answer to, to this question. from both of you is that you need some kind of local presence or connection to, to expand into China. And mm -hmm. what has really been the effect in the last 18 months or so since the pandemic to your bridge building to China and how have you coped with, with that and kept the game going? Yeah. We haven't, <laughs> not really. So no, but uh, I mean, you, that's two things about the travel situation and Corona times. I think it's a very good thing that people don't go over weekends to China and um, pollute all the air because they have just a business meeting over there and then come back. Um, I think you see right now that the economy is still running. China, Germany, everything is still running. You don't need these. But if you go to, uh, if you like what, what we just talked about, if you want to know the country, you have to go there. You have to experience the country. I myself, it, it, I have a really hard time to, to keep up because I haven't been there now for two years. So it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's very complicated. And all the virtual delegation tours or Zoom meetings, they don't come up to this um, standard, I guess. And, um, but what I've seen, and uh, we will also talk about this actually in a satellite uh, on Friday at TechCode, um, that com some companies building up parallel in, in eco different ecosystems. So we have one company in our incubator, for example, that has a presence in Germany, in Berlin, as well in Beijing. And they have a co-founder there, and they have a co-founder here, and they have a team there, and they have a team here. And they they... Right from the start, they 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 are remotely working and working with each other and leveraging on both ecosystem and both talent pool strength and weak strengths. So that's a one trend maybe I have seen in the mm -hmm. past in the past two years. Yeah. And yours was born right in the middle of uh, the pandemic. Always <laughs> taking on the challenge. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, as I mentioned, it, it we're also using digital formats we 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 we're trying to collect expertise from both sides and and going into mentoring sessions but still it's not as visiting living seeing the culture seeing the people experience it but we we really do as much as we can that you at least get a get a feeling of it for example we also work together with um, china Centrum of Technical University to get an additional view. We we get all the, the skills like um, uh, with intellectual property with a good mentoring. So so we we can put a lot of efforts into preparing it. But we need to go over there one day. So <laughs> I hope it will be uh, rather soon. But we'll see. And 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 and. And um, we also have an, on 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 Friday satellite event where we where we connect our uh, we are located at the AI campus at Berlin, so we have an office space, an incubator space, accelerator space here in Berlin. And as I mentioned, we also opening up one in in, in China, and there we build a virtual uh, bridge and also uh, invite um, um, a startup from China and who competes with a startup from Germany. And then we have a panel there discussion. So we we keep it running, let's say, with this formats, but also already start to. Uh, connect our physic physical spaces here in Berlin and 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 in China, especially with um, with the topic artificial intelligence, which Berlin is also quite pretty strong in research. Yeah. I'm sure we'll all find a way around it, just as we did for this summit as well. <laughs> and and Kim, how has this effect? How has the pandemic affected uh, your uh, internationalization strategy? 
of digital hubs. Like you said, most of the time it's you're on on route and attending conferences and helping there. So yeah, that of course uh, stopped also last year. I mean, like everywhere, all, all over the world. Um, I mean, fortunately, uh, we can start again now. As I said last week, a uh, big tech conference in Amsterdam. Then we go to Web Summit uh, with about 100 startups. And then uh, we go to Slush, also with a huge Germany booth. Um, finally, things are happening again. Nevertheless, this is only one part of our international support for our ecosystem and for the startups uh, in our ecosystem. Um, a lot of work that we've been doing at uh, Germany Trade and Invest for the Digital Hub Initiative is actually remote work, and that is the, the connectivity with international actors, and that is um, economic development organizations uh, in other countries, ministries in other countries, business associations, accelerators, and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, this happened uh, also digitally um, before uh, the pandemic started, um, and, and we could continue um, these bridge building uh, on an institutional level. But nevertheless, um, I totally agree uh, that you know when you work with startups and, and support them in the international expansion, talking about another country, connecting them with players in another country um, is, is one level. But then finally going there, experiencing the market is a totally different thing to really figure out you know, how it feels there. Um, and uh, if if the product or the solution is, is really right for the market and, and you know to make the the relevant connections um, to be successful so um you know of course these activities stopped also for us um and um you know we're not as a as the you know um partner of the digital hub initiative um not only us are doing this but each individual hub is also working with their own startups and uh, for them it's pretty much the same um, um, so they have their own uh, European-wide or global uh, programs uh, for their startups. Um, those were on hold, and they are starting again. Indeed, show must go on. <laughs> and Thomas, we have a question for you. Actually, it was sent on LinkedIn, but it was more about um, by by a startup that at what stage should I um, am I eligible actually to apply for German Accelerator? And will uh, I have a, a different batch if I want to expand into Asia and I want to expand into US or will I have a same batch? Very specific question. <laughs> if I want to expand into Asia and US both. Uh, good, good questions. Uh, cover a lot of ground, so uh, um, will be difficult to, to answer all of them in detail, but like most importantly, uh, to all startups out there, please feel free to, to reach out um, to me, to my team, the, the Scouts of German Accelerators. Um, we're not uh, only considering ourselves as kind of the truffle picks to find the right startups. We're really trying to be trusted advisors when it comes to, to internationalization. We've all been founders ourselves, and we hope that we can like give a little advice from that what we learned. So bottom line, please reach out. Um, in general, German Accelerator, like, you know, we've been here for like almost 10 years now, and um, most people know us for our market access programs in, in Asia and the US. But um, also we developed over the last years, basically programs that cover the whole internationalization journey for startups. Um, especially since last year, we also started the program, which is based here in Germany. I mean, now, unfortunately, everything runs virtual, right? But uh, it will be in, uh, in Germany. Um, takes two weeks, 20 hours per week, so really like a slim uh, program um, in order to prepare for internationalization. And there we target startups that, um, yeah, like really see first traction um, here in the or in their home market, um, that um, see internationalization as a topic kind of on the horizon that they want to prepare for it. And uh, that's basically the, the start point when it comes uh, to our uh, programs. Um, but then again, um, we're really happy to help. And um, as I said before, you know, um, no startup is the same as the other one. So basically, for some, it might also be true that, you know, on day one, you need to think about internationalization. Um, I'm just thinking of an example, like uh, a peer to peer lending startup uh, from Germany. Um, they came in contact with us, like, um, by chance, to be honest. Yeah? And we started talking and, and we realized, like, wait, the market in, in Asia is so much more advanced for you guys. I mean, you're early stage, you're three guys, but could you could you think of, like, moving your whole office to, to Asia and start there? 
And uh, basically, that's what they did. And they're now super successful. And now they're coming back to, to Germany. That's also possible. If, would you like to share the name of this startup? Uh, if, if that's okay, I would not. <laughs> okay, sure. But because I think such stories are also very interesting. And mm -hmm. I think one of them today uh, from German Accelerator, Exalon, is coming in the evening to, to talk about their internationalization journey. Uh, also, I would like to say at this point, we are open to questions. So if anybody has one, just raise your hand. And to make it more relatable, I'm going to ask for one success story each from our... Uh, panelists when it comes to internationalization and probably yours Thomas is one done and you can give a plus one to us if uh, you are in the mood to share another success story but probably Till are you up for it? Yeah actually the the one I just talked about <laughs> yeah. um, is, a, is a very interesting success story where um, you have a business model that is already in uh, the China case Mm -hmm. is very clear already the the startup um what i just talked about i also don't know if i can share the name so i'd rather not so <laughs> okay yeah, so. so that um that's the the internet on on the plane where you mm -hmm. um where they decided to go to china very early on and where they uh had the approach to do two different uh companies one set up in china one set up in germany and have them work independently so also get the chinese give a lot of authority to the chinese subsidiary find their own investors and have them work very independently at the same time in germany they are um doing the th doing the same so that's that's a, a, a kind of a success story that i that i want, can share there's also others but maybe we have more here as well yeah. and also is there any story where you said that okay china is not for you oh yeah the, i mean the, there's a lot of startups that that come to us and they have for example a car sharing app or uh, or a food service delivery app and obviously i mean you, you can go to china and um, and try to implement that there and maybe find a chinese co-founder and go into the market but it's very hard to internationalize this kind of business to china mm. so there's a um I, I don't cannot think of any one specific startup at the moment but um there's many 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 startups we have to reject in that in that sense that they do not um are not in an area of of technology or not in an area of uh um of business that they would be able to compete very easily or have a win-win situation with china or can leverage maybe also on some weaknesses in China. We're talking about industry, uh, smart manufacturing or something, then there's a, actually a, a very uh, um, competitive advantage of German startups in the whole industry 4.0 um, area, all the startups that you see on Hannover Messe, they, they have, a, have a very good advantage to go into China. And obviously China is also not 100% ready yet in the most industry 4.0. They're just, they're moving towards there. They've d d didn't done a lot of B2C. Now they're slowly moving into B2B. But um, that's, for example, an area um, that is very interesting. And it's also interesting that, for example, uh, startups uh, I have seen, they, they went to China, they spent their four, three to four weeks, they evaluated the whole situation, and they decided to not do it. And then they and then they reevaluate. This is what I would say. I think in one in particular industries, you have to think this China or Asia internationalization question again and again. You cannot say, okay, I'm not I'm not doing it this year, but you have to reevaluate on the next in the next year probably and think what how how have my priorities shifted and maybe I can do this do the decision now and, and go into the market. Yeah. Perseverance when it comes to China. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And do any success stories come to your mind when it comes to internationalization of university-based startups? Yeah. Well, in general, yes. <laughs> and um, like for when you look at Humboldt University, but our internationalization program is quite early. So for China especially, but when you look on on a, like a decade ago, that uh, the, the founders from Bubble started with Humboldt University. As you know, Bubble is quite now expanding yes. also to international markets and and it's very interesting to see when you see this young team in 2008 
and now it's um, an amazing journey. And what we also learn, of course, from our teams, as I mentioned before, like the team setting, you know, 40% of our founders are already non-Germans. Yeah, so, yeah. and that's very helpful because you also can enter the market with, you know, already whatever mm. market it is. And we see that that's, that's a big advantage and something also we really benefit from the high internationalization of Berlin, the high internationalization of our founders teams. It's also a tool to promote internationalization and the knowledge of our, of and success of hopefully of our founders. It's, it's something where you can, but at a very, very early stage, even when they try to meet, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, focus on to help them when maybe in 10 years on. So but that's just some examples. So, I mean, if about internationalization, yes, we did speak, but there's a very interesting figure you said about 40% of them are non-Germans. And it would be great to know some of these, uh, you know, trends that you have seen in university-based startups over the years, like in terms of their maturity, how they are increasing, decreasing, like, Give us an overview of what are the three major changes that you have seen in the university-based startup ecosystem in the last three years or so, but, or maybe more. Yeah, but I think maybe also in, in general, what I mentioned before, that universities in Germany learn to, to become more professional in supporting their startups and spin-offs. You know, they, they build up structures, a lot of incubation space. And that's something we approved over, over the last decades. Also, again, with, with massive help from, from the government, of course. But there is an understanding that is, that is a very important career path you can go. And that's something from the structure. People need to see that there are, there are lots of efforts done to support those startups. And the, from the point of view, in general, it really depends also on the research. Yeah, so our research is moving on. So is uh, the trends of our startups moving on because it always depends on the innovations from our research. And of course, interdisciplinarity is a, a big topic. Now we are so focused on the buzzword AI, whatever this means for many, but so what we do, we use it and go deeply into our research, different research paths and try to, to find the applications there. And that's something that we focus much, much more on, on real topics and not just in the broad way, hey, hello, we have a startup service. It's, 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 it's not the way anymore. You really need to focus on, 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 on um, uh, natural language processing. You need to focus on, on, on um, uh, applications you can find with quantum technologies, which is difficult because the market is not there yet. So, But it's something what, which is demanded from the startup services in university to have a focus on that. And, and from the startup point of view, it's, it's interesting that when, when I started, everyone wanted to do an IPO. You know, mm -hmm. our goal is IPO. Today, it's more like I want to be happy. I want to create a company. And if I'm in this company for, for, for all my life, the, let's say the typical Mittelstand, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's also a switch in thinking, more of impact focus and, and that. And that's personally, it's, it's, it's nice to see and also something we, we support. And... Um, it's important that you don't lose a competitive edge because sometimes that's something something I miss a little. You know that again, comparing to Asian startups, the competitive edge of European or German startups, oh, it, it, it's good they see where where the where the competition is in other countries. That's very important. And that's also why we do this internationalization mm. programs mm. that you you know how competitive, for example, a Chinese startup can be or, uh, or or from Singapore. That's really important to see what's going on in the world. And and that's that's maybe another thing. And how do they uh, cope with competition when they actually reach that stage? Uh, I, in my personal opinion, uh, humans are very uh, um, adaptable to things, but they need to see it. That's that's mm. important thing. Yeah. Otherwise, you live in a bubble and you never see what you have to improve on yourself. That's mm. that's the most important thing. Okay. And coming to you, Kim, uh, what have been one of your favorite success stories in your tenure when it comes to internationalization of uh, startups? Well, I mean, first of all, um, in the initiative, we don't only focus on the internationalization of the startups. Well, we, mm. we focus on the internationalization of ecosystems. Mm. Um, so, you know, maybe I'm a little bit different than here, uh, than, you know, from uh, you know, my peers on stage, uh, because we see ourselves not as a service provider 
to startups, but as a service provider to the hub managers and to the hubs themselves, to the ecosystems. So it's, let's say one layer on top. Um, but just to give you some really good examples here, um, you know, from a corporate side, uh, I mean, it has to do with startups. Um, you know, one of our hubs in Stuttgart, uh, um, they just recently acquired a huge uh, Turkish company um, that wants to settle down, build a factory, do the whole R&D there, and revolutionize the German electromobility market. Um, and they came there specifically because they knew that the region is well connected and there is our digital hub, um, you know, where a lot of interesting startups are already part of the community. And that's, of course, is, is wonderful because it's then this is the, the, the connection you know, which mm -hmm. you need as a startup, but also as a company. Um, but you know, talking about startups, I mean, as I said, I just came back from a, a huge tech fair uh, and uh, we brought uh, 20 uh, tech startups from our ecosystem to Amsterdam uh, to the next web conference. We had a big booth um, and we showcased eight of the startups over the two days. Um, all of them had wonderful talks uh, with investors, with VCs, uh, with, with potential customers. You know, and one startup, you know, after half a day, was so happy they said, "Hey, we can almost go home." You now we had three fantastic leads uh, already in the morning. You know, what else do we want? Um, and you know, this is this is what we see as a success in our activity you know, because we pro we provide the platform, but the startup has to use them. If they just sit down at the booth and don't do anything, mm. you know, it's their problem. But if you're active out there and you take care, you know, of you know, the opportunities, then you can make something out of it. So indeed, if you have to go international, you need all four of our uh, panelists on this uh, on this panel. And we have a few minutes more, so we can take a question or two if we have from the audience. Okay, then. So, but I think I would like to conclude with one line each from all of you in terms of what is your message to startups from Germany that want to internationalize and startups from Asia that want to internationalize. So, probably with full curve uh, Okay, for the German startups, um, or at least or who are in the stage of founding a company, um, I want underlines that to be curious about other markets to do not close your eyes and and and, and really just focus is important what thomas said i'm sure but at least acquire some knowledge what what chances you have in other markets do not live in a bubble and really understand the competition here that's that, that's really the main goal and be open for it and at least invest some time in those for you already structured programs. All of us offer structured programs which are very time efficient to use these chances. That's very important. And for, for the Asian-based startups, of course, as a, as a research institute, we are open for uh, 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 connecting them with our uh, highly innovative research. And we have our structures to um, come to Berlin, find a scientific mentor, start your company in Berlin. And, and, and that's my message uh, from that direction. Love it. Yeah. Um, I would, I mean, I would have, to, I would say the same, but maybe I can add one thing to the German startups. Um, use those programs and really go there to China, but then make a decision quick also. So, so go there maybe one week, two weeks, and then you decide Am I going to invest more or am I um, say no to China first and, and redo it on the next? Because what I'm also seeing is a lot of um, startups that maybe get hooked with China or there's this fear of missing out. Uh, China is such a big market. If I don't only get one, one point, one, mm -hmm. zero point one percent, I'm going to be rich. So also make a cut again and uh, and then re-evaluate, re okay, that was not one sentence, but... <laughs> yeah, no, but it makes sense, like know when to stop and, and come yeah, back. Exactly. So. Yeah, exactly. And for Chinese companies, um, yeah, I think they they are more maybe, maybe they also also to take a little bit more risk and, uh, and, and look, come also to Germany and see what they can do here. I think they're more, much more educated on the market here that we, than we are with mm -hmm. their market. And they come, when they come, they come with a really clear focus but I would say maybe in Chinese are taking risk a lot, but maybe with international laser to Germany, maybe invest some more time, take more risk uh, for a certain amount of time and try it out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Kim? I would say to the startups, you're not alone. Now, first of all, there are a lot of other startups, you know, that have made it to international markets successfully. 
So if you find them, talk to them, uh, um, share, share the experiences that they have uh, and get some recommendations, but also make use of their networks uh, because they also didn't do it alone probably. Uh, and you can also benefit you know, from uh, other partners. And uh, when it's my job to promote Germany as a fantastic <laughs> business location, so I could talk for hours about it. Um, but the key is here as well, you know, come here, um, you know, find the right partners. Um, there are public uh, agencies around here like us on a national level, but also on each state, you know, there are economic development organizations, you know, you get a service free of charge and it's their job to help you uh, to be successful in Germany. So make use of that. You are not alone and we are here to welcome you in Germany as well. And yeah, I can see him here as well. <laughs> so that's why. Uh, and Thomas, uh, your uh, your one line each or more, maybe. Okay, the one line would be I can just second what uh, uh, all my peers just just said. Um, that's exactly right. Um, maybe a general statement. Um, I'm really surprised that internationalization is not part of each startup playbook. Like it's so important, as uh, Volker, I think, said, like there's so many opportunities that uh, that should be seized and um, there's so much methodology as well out there. Um, what I'm happy to see is that alone on that stage, there is uh, four people that are just there to help startups. Um, I think we're all doing it uh, for free. We have like uh, at least the German accelerator um, it's our mandate um, to help startups. We're not charging. We're basically a, a boutique consultancy that works for free. Um, so, you know, message to the startups, um, come talk to us, come talk to, to the other guys on, on stage and really seize their, those opportunities. Thank you. And that's what we all are about, connecting startup ecosystems even at Asia Berlin. And this is the platform as well, if you want to expand into uh, Asia or from Asia if you want to expand into Berlin and then Europe. So thank you very much for joining us, all of you, and it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.